<clears throat> All right. So um, um, my name is Mark, and um, I'm the one of the co-lead uh, coordinating ministers of a new amalgamated congregation called Broadview. And this is a coming together of two congregations who um, were not at a place of decline or a place of death, but rather at a place of um, needing to pivot um, and recognizing that uh, it was time to think about church and progressive Christianity differently. And so we engaged in an amalgamation process, and that's a whole uh, other piece of story. Um, but as we did that, we also wanted to recognize that the church needed to shift the places from which it derives its primary uh, sources of income, which is donations. Uh, we recognized in each of our congregations that about a quarter of those who were um, pretty stalwart givers and pretty critical to the overall budget, um, about 25% of those were 80 and over um, and that's not unusual when we did the kind of a demographic analysis of our two congregations it came out almost identical which was interesting and talking with other colleagues there seems to be something common about that that's not sustainable um, so that along with the fact that uh, uh, millennials and the generations that come tend to be more attracted to uh, one-time kind of uh, philanthropy uh, go fund me those kinds of things we knew that we were going to need to start to find other ways to stabilize the income for uh, churches so that they could continue to do their mission and ministry. But we didn't want to do it in a way that also wasn't consistent with our values of who we were. And so we uh, struck a small working group um, of entrepreneurs and uh, people who had both uh, lived experience of uh, starting up businesses and running businesses, um, as well as a passion for um, their church and their congregation. And uh, they did a lots of brainstorming and lots of thinking and lots of kind of um, musing and research around the whole concept of social enterprise. And there's lots of stuff you can read online about that, but social enterprise basically is a business that also has a social purpose or a greater benefit for community. And so as they worked, they decided that uh, there were three mandates that, that they had. One was to bring a sustainable revenue stream for the church for the future. The second was to be mission-centered and honoring sound business practices together with core values that lived out our integrity. And thirdly was to discern what kind of current needs of the community or world at large might be addressed by this social enterprise that would contribute to the transformation of individuals and systems in the process of doing business. No small task. And so as they began to do the work, um, uh, they looked at lots of different pieces and what emerged uh, was an opportunity to get involved in um, home care or health care. Um, uh, Victoria, perhaps um, like many other communities, but certainly is acute here, um, is a place that people often come uh, to retire. And so we know that uh, from research that 96% of seniors will age in place um, and have a desire to be able to uh, end their lives in their own homes. But their capacity to do that diminishes over time. We also know that from um, uh, the dis, uh, diaspora of families that often people don't have an immediate family member often in uh, the area or if they do uh, their own life is in a place where they can't be offering care to their parents at the rate perhaps that they would like to be able to do that. We also heard from many of those who are receiving care from lots of different companies that one of their chief um, complaints was the rotation of persons and never really knowing who was coming in and out of their home um, and uh, a sense that they were merely an object um, and not somebody for whom relationships were built. And so we looked to um, developing something where a, a relationally based home care would be um, the business that we could become involved in. And we found that there were uh, quite a number of companies doing that uh, and franchises, most of them American, um, but there were two that were Canadian. And one of them was a startup 
uh, out of Vancouver that had been running for nine years and was just now beginning the process of franchising. And we decided to invest in franchising for um, a variety of things. Um, a, because in lots of startup stuff, uh, the front end um, work in getting things up and going with systems and logos and advertising and all those kind of things are kind of managed already by the franchise. And so we felt it was perhaps a soft way for a congregation to get into uh, a social enterprise. And so we joined um, uh, and made application to be part of something called Just Like Family and their values as a business align with ours. And as a business, they actually spent a fair bit of time interviewing us. They'd had over 25 um, applicants for this particular franchise on Southern Vancouver Island. And they had rejected all of them because the, the business owners didn't line up with the values and the ways in which they wanted to run a business. Um, when we approached them, uh, they were open uh, to that possibility. And so we began to explore that and then do the next big task, which was to try to then bring um, a joint council up to speed uh, in trying to understand what this would mean. And uh, for them to pivot quite quickly, um, a business plan was put together uh, with both short-term and long-term projections. Um, and we were lucky that the chair of the committee uh, was somebody who'd done quite a number of startups. And she was eager um, and willing to kind of help us through this process. Uh, the long and short of it is we began the business um, uh, and took it on. And um, we're now into month six of running it and uh, um, have found ourselves pivoting lots along the way. Um, one of the key pieces for us at the beginning was to try to figure out where the capital would come from to both purchase the franchise um, and then for all of those uh, expenses that happen uh, at the beginning while you employ folks and uh, do the kinds of things that need to be done before you have enough revenue. Um, both of our churches have some um, assets that are uh, invested as well as significant um, capital um, assets in property. And so we had assumed that it would not be a big deal for us to get a commercial loan, a line of credit to help us in this process. Uh, those who were on that uh, social enterprise committee also thought saw that as not a big issue. They had all gotten those kind of startup loans many, many times. And we were looking for less than $100,000 to do that. What we encountered after we had, to, and we had the money to do the initial purchase of the franchise, what we encountered was a huge wall. And we approached about eight or nine different kind of financial institutions from your regular banks to uh, credit unions to small business uh, banks to all sorts of things with folks who typically would take in those business plans and be successful in that. Consistently, what we heard was, you're a church, you're not a good risk, and you're bad for publicity if we have to foreclose on you, so we won't lend you money. Um, and so that was uh, an interesting wall for us to come up to uh, over and over and again. Even when we were willing to put up $400,000 in uh, cash assets against this, we still could not get the line of credit. Um, so that was an intriguing piece. Uh, we ended up um, having a an individual on that social enterprise who put up the money as a loan to us um, because they believed in what we were doing. And we also ended up with help from um, EDGE uh, to also um, over time take over that loan uh, to create for us uh, the beginnings of like a line of credit, but not uh, a typical kind of line of credit. Our forecasts uh, were that by the end of the first year that we would be at the break even point um, and that into um, year two, we'd be at the place where the number of client hours that we had would require us to have a second person for doing scheduling of care workers. Uh, we immediately had hired a, a health care manager who does the assessments, puts the care plan together, interviews the caregivers and then matches those folks together. Um, we have found ourselves after six months outpacing by almost um, 
nine months, uh, our business plan and where we thought we would be. Um, so at the end of the day, we find ourselves in some unique places. COVID, of course, um, asked us to kind of pivot. Um, as you're well aware, seniors were one of the greatest risk groups during this pandemic. And uh, naturally, some of our seniors were worried about having other people come into their home. So there were a few clients that decided they would um, stop our services. But there were a whole number of other folks for whom um, they had been traveling back and forth into Victoria to see their parents once a month and support them who could no longer do that that we're looking for the kind of consistent care that we were offering. So we were able to pivot to make sure that our caregivers uh, on the most part are only in one client's home to kind of meet all the different kind of protocols to make sure that we were keeping those seniors and those caregivers safe. And we found uh, our business uh, increasing from a, a number of different reasons over this period of time. Uh, it's required us to learn things like um, uh, Google marketing, uh, Facebook marketing, um, uh, and a bunch of those kind of pieces, and pivoting around uh, much of that. But at the end of the day, one of the things that we really learned was that uh, Sarah, our CEO of this board, was very, very critical of the success of this building, uh, building this business. Uh, and I should, I missed another step. As we began to kind of think about this, we knew we were going into a for-profit kind of business. And we had to think about the ways in which we would shield the charitable status of the church. So we uh, met with uh, uh, um, a lawyer um, um, that specialized in CRA and uh, corporate business stuff to be able to make sure we could figure out a vehicle. And again, it took us a fair bit of research uh, and work with EDGE to figure out what might be the best vehicle, whether a C3 uh, in federal programming or using some of the provincial statutes. In the end, we decided to use the provincial statutes and we created an incorporated numbered company, uh, which would become the sole shareholder. Um, and we had to be very careful to use the language that the church was investing in this company, not that the church owned the company. So we were investing in the number company and it was the number company then that was the interfacing with the franchise. Um, that became part of the learning and we continue to do some learning around that. One of the other pieces that we were told by um, our legal opinion was the board of directors needed to not wear two hats at all. They could not be involved in any of the governance in the churches, but they needed to be independent. So our way of keeping our connection is that the um, number company has a small board of three and those board members are appointed by uh, the shareholders, which is the church. Um, and so they're accountable to us, but they're independent from us. So at this point, six months into it, we had put into the franchise agreement that uh, we would have first right of refusal to the franchise next to us, which is the rest of the island, the northern part, assuming that three years down the line, we would uh, probably have to exercise that option. So we find ourselves now at this uh, year point from the first point that we kind of got into this, having now to exercise the option if we wish to and make the decision to expand into the second franchise. And so to do that, we've decided we need to move to a different kind of business plan and have the person who really has been shepherding and helping this grow move into an equity position. And uh, so we've made the decision that we will uh, move into uh, a, a position where the person um, who is the CEO also has shares and equity that keeps their connection to the company and uh, their investment, sometimes called skin in the game, um, uh, in the growth of this company. But at the same time, uh, the church is the major shareholder. And so uh, we always gain uh, both control and income. We're on more th on, uh, than on plan uh, in terms of uh, where we'll be. You probably are interested in numbers. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, within uh, four years, we should be doing uh, with each franchise about a million dollars of income, uh, sorry, of uh, business, which will generate after uh, the equity shares have come out. Uh, of about three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars a year of income for the church, so that's where we're headed. 
Uh, that's a sizable shift about the way that churches um, are organized. It allows us to be a large church um, um, that offers multiple platforms and multiple different ways of doing mission and ministry in the world, um, but also allows us to be sustainable uh, into the future. So that's our story.